first time to grab anything with it, but um, and that's what kind of wow. gave us some hope. That's just projecting his very small fingers there? Uh, uh, he's just bending his wrist, so oh, just like with the initial prototype where the bending of the stump made motion, the bending of his wrist makes motion because he has an intact palm. Um, at that point, we knew he was going to outgrow it. Somebody said, hey, what about 3D printing? So the, the internet's a wonderful place. I went online, found tutorials, started learning about 3D, 3D design, found other enthusiasts and makers that were just that were uploading, hey, here's how you do solid modeling in this program. And uh, so I was able to benefit from, from those, those folks' hobbies, made this printable version, uh, which then that included a thumb. Uh, that turned into a more refined version of that same hand, which he surprised us by picking up points wow. with. Um, and uh, this is, now Liam's exceptional. He's, he really is a very determined kid. So he spent a lot of time practicing. His brother encouraged him. Um, to, to his credit, he helped move this forward because he showed what it was possible to do with the hands. Uh, and then at that point, we decided, okay, we've got this design, it's printable, it can be represented as digital files. So we uploaded it to the internet with a public domain license, hoping that people would do stuff with it. Um, that included, uh, you know, doing some radio interviews, etc. And then this guy heard. Uh, heard you heard not enough here. You would just pull up the video. Yeah, how do I find it? What's the easiest path? Um, and I'm, I'm, my computer doesn't like this right now. I'm gonna make it like it. <laughs> uh, just, oh no. Okay. Uh, where, where's my mouse? Okay, what am I looking for? Uh, the, uh, um, which one do you want to do? It's up to you. You want to do the original one we did? Let's do Iron Man one. Okay, uh, just type in, you know, Iron Man. RDJ Bionic Arm or something? Yeah, RDJ Bionic Arm. Okay. Like the best one. Uh, RDJ Bionic Arm. Okay, first thing. So, you want to give them the backstory on how this happened, though, uh, Albert? Type in collective project after it, so it equals to the video. Oh yeah, <laughs> YouTube. Official YouTube. YouTube. Okay, so why don't you give them a little background on this? Okay, so I, I've been driving in a car and I heard I've been on the other end of the car in the radio um, talking about the project. And I was I'm an aerospace engineer, and so we went into our research lab. And um, I had always wanted to use engineering for more than just inside the laboratory. Um, and I'm in the aerospace industry, and so a lot of our stuff goes into like defense applications, right? My whole life I've been planning to work in defense. Um, I heard the story and, and the opportunity to take what I do in an abstract way in an engineering lab and be able to actually help someone was really appealing. Um, and uh, part of the university experience is your goal is to be able to impact your community. I really believe that. Um, and so I went into my research lab and I said, absolutely, I, I have to be a part of this. I told all my friends and I said, how can we be a part of this solution, help push it forward? So I contacted Richard, he put me in touch with Ivan, and we spent like eight months not really doing anything productive, just kind of like messing around on the computer design software. Uh, and then one day, a mom contacted us and said, can you build my son an arm? And uh, I just gotten married, and so after I got back in my honeymoon, we started working on this project uh, to use 3D printing for a child who didn't have an elbow. Um, and there is no mechanical solution if you don't have an elbow uh, in existence. And so we made a prototype and a couple more prototypes that were really successful and they had been on the news. Um, and then we stumbled across this really good opportunity with Microsoft who had got involved. And, um, and so they contacted a friend and they made this video for us too. So, and to preface this, and this is something that started with, like, I know you're, you, you like sci-fi and, and like the genre as well, right? So it started with people that are fans of the genre, are probably inspired by that genre, and... When I was in high school, I love the movie, yeah. Oh, I wanted to do it when I was in high school. Let's go down here.
progress report. outside of this, uh, I'd love to hear more about your backgrounds as well. Uh, how do we make conscious decisions to work within the framework that we're given in the corporate society because we have to play by the rules uh, in order to be employed? Uh, we still assert the fact that we want to take care of people uh, and we want to help them. So with that, we'll kind of put everything up for questions, uh, especially with your backgrounds too, since it's yeah. four of us. Are, oh, are you all? Yeah, we're all kind of in the same field. <laughs> Um, sure, so I am a mom, I have eight and five-year-old, um, I said I'm a grown homeschooler, unschooler, and I've actually been unschooling my oldest for, I think it'll be two and a half years here this spring. I, I pulled him out of kindergarten halfway through because he didn't want to go, and I completely understand, I, I, I dropped out, but I was homeschooled after third grade because I didn't want to go to school, and I just, I couldn't, I still can't bring myself to make him go someplace that he doesn't want to go, and I fully admit to hating. Um, since then, I've been, for about two years now, I've been teaching classes at a homeschool co-op that we drive up to Akron for. Um, six times in the fall and six times in the spring. Um, I've done a class on, my first one was just about two software family, so I had six students, and that's what I had most of the time, and I gave them each a USB stick with some version of Ubuntu whatever was on at the time, I forget now. Um, and just help them walk them through installing if they wanted to, or just live booting, and talking about free software and what it is, and why it's important, and why you should care about freedom, and not just the freedom that you're given something, but the freedom to use it and do whatever you want with it. Um, and that fall, I do believe I taught a class on, maybe that spring, on cryptography, the same, most of the same students, and again, we used, uh, at that point, I think they gave them USB sticks with, uh, forget what it, what is it, the, the distribution that Tor produces, that's completely, um, it gives you an encrypted system, and everything is run through Tor automatically, for some reason, my mind is showing the book right now, that's it, Tails, thank you. <laughs> um, and again, just kind of talked about how to set up um, 
on encryption with your email and how to encrypt your hard drive and all those sorts of things and why you should care about security and privacy. Similar to a lot of the things that Bruce and I talked about last night. Um, uh, this year I did a class um, that just finished up on computer hardware. So honestly, I mostly took old, you know, how many old systems do you have that are in pieces um, and let the kids tear them apart and see what's inside a computer. Because how many kids get to do that, you know? Computers are, are generally thought of as these expensive things that no, you can't open them up and do first. No, parents don't appreciate for some reason, but I, I do that. <laughs> there was always extra screws. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. So we had multiple old desktops and laptops. I think somebody had an old tablet that didn't work. And just tearing things apart and letting them see what's inside them. And, and all that. Um, next fall, I'm planning to, I assume I'll be running it, uh, a class on Ruby programming. And my first attempt at teaching kids programming. I know a little bit about programming. I'm not a great programmer. Most of what I do when I do computer free software is um, mostly editing. They edit a lot for the GNOME project. Um, their annual reports, their news releases, all that sort of stuff. Often I'm the last set of eyes reading through. Yes? If you like a really good way to learn how to program on your own, I can give you a lot of really good online resources. Sure. Uh, sure, that'd be great. Yeah, that's what I, I, I did Summer of Code a couple years ago when I briefly went back to school for one semester and remembered how much I hated school once more. <laughs> Um, and I, I worked through that, how to learn Python the hard way, and that, <laughs> yeah, everybody can relate to that one. Um, and this ended up being a successful summer of code student with Safe Lotfi, Safe Lotfi, and Alan Day writing the own box. So that's that's in a nutshell. So you're teaching kid, uh, young girls essentially the skills so that they can go on. Yep. Yep. So, Girls in Code we're a national nonprofit. Um, oh, okay. uh, we're, we're based in New York, um, and we actually have programs now in nine cities across the country. Uh, we launched in 2012 with one program of 20 students, um, and these are girls who, some of them have, you know, taken as much as like AP computer science. Some of them have never even seen a lot of code before. And uh, we put them through our summer immersion program, we call it. It's a seven week, uh, Monday to Friday, nine to four program. And they essentially go through CS 101 concepts, uh, like college level concepts, in the seven weeks. And by the end of it, they're building, you know, freestanding and actually operating apps, websites, you know, what have you. So it's really cool to see, especially the ones who, you know, don't know up from down, but you know, <laughs> inside a computer, and then by the end of it, they're able to build, you know, video games and just really cool stuff. So, uh, we started, like I said, you know, we started in 2012 uh, with one program. This year, we've expanded now to 57 programs across the country, so we've been very much on a rapid rate of expansion. Um, and uh, in addition to our summer program, that's uh, primarily that's offered to girls who are going into their 11th and 12th grade year. So it's kind of like a direct intervention just before, you know, as they're starting to think about SATs, uh, college um, applications, that sort of thing, to kind of encourage them to, to consider CS as a career path. Um, but we also have an after-school clubs model that's open to junior high and high schoolers. So it's a little bit more accessible, I think, to, you know, to most kids, um, and the, all of it is free across the students, so we're completely funded by corporate sponsors, foundation sponsors, some high net worth individuals, but the girls don't pay, which is really cool. So, what, what language do you guys use? Do you start with? We start, the first week we do Scratch, um, primarily, we, yeah, I mean, the visual, I don't know if everyone's familiar with it, but it kind of looks like Legos um, that you're building uh, a program with, and so for the girls who haven't, you know, necessarily seen programming before, it's a it's a good way to kind of learn the concepts without having to learn the syntax and, like, the more specific um, things about coding or, you know, within one language, and from there we, we primarily do Python but we do do some JavaScript, um, HTML, CSS, uh, that sort of thing as well. But each week is kind of a different module that we do. So the first week is just kind of an intro to computer science. Make sure everyone is kind of, you know, 
to some level up to speed. Um, and then the second week they do robotics. Um, the third week they do mobile applications um, and like entrepreneurship. Uh, then they do web applications or like you know website development, I guess. And then finally we do um, algorithm and data structures. So that's some really high level stuff um, for anyone who's taken you know a CS degree. Like that's oftentimes you don't see that until you're. Fourth or fifth, yeah, until <laughs> your fourth or fifth semester of college. So, you know, they don't come out of it as like Jack Dorsey or something, but like they definitely come out of it being able to build something really cool. And we actually have had um, a couple of our, we, some of the girls, you know, they're all very entrepreneurial on their own. It's so funny, they like come back to us and tell us about the cool stuff that they've done. Um, and we've had a couple of our alumni actually get their final project on the App Store, so you can download it today. Um, it's really cool the things that the you know the girls want to build. They're, they're things that only a 16-year-old girl would think of. <laughs> and so this specific uh, video game, the girls were like, you know, we really like video games, we're really into that, but we don't really understand why every video game that we want to play, there's like, you know, guns, whatever, like we're not into that. We want to make a video game about tampons. <laughs> and they're like, you know, we want to reduce the stigma about menstruation, whatever, so they have this like shooter game that we throw tampons at boys. And it's just, it's really silly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's called Tampon Run. We can actually pull it to Tampon Run. Tampon Run. It's, it's, a, it's, oh, a, it's an app? Yep, it's an Android app. or Apple? Uh, Apple. <laughs> <laughs> you can't play it online. Only on Apple? Uh, yeah, it's uh, in the app store. <laughs> but yeah, you can go to tampon.com. I, I need that ported to Android. I have not allowed you to Google that. <laughs> 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 That's one great example. Um, another it was great on one. MTV too. Oh yeah, it's been. I mean, it's been on Buzzfeed. They were in Huffington Post. They did a TEDx talk in New York. Like, they're all over the place. Like, we're like, oh look, it's Andy and Sophie doing something cool. Oh, there it is. Yep, there it is. <laughs> And now for the next half hour, we're going to move on to the Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it was like this little moment, you know, within the class where they were like, it was like this rally moment. They're like, this is why we need more girl developers. <laughs> and like, is it, you know, is it malicious? Like, I don't think so. Probably, you know, some guy was programming this and was like, hey, like, let me, you know, I'll put it online. I'm testing it maybe on himself. A couple of his friends put it out there. But, own, if that's the whole story and that's 90% of developers are, are of one voice range, <laughs> you know, like you're really kind of separating out the other half of the population. And so it was really, it was a cool like learning moment for them to be like, oh yeah, this is why we, this is why we need girls in the space. So it was really cool. Um, computer science is one of the few professions in the last 30 years that have actually seen a decline women participation. Um, in the 80s, it was something like 37% of software developers were women, and anymore it's closer to 12-15%. So it's really interesting. Um, I think that you know the media representation has really had a lot to do with, with that. Um, in the 80s, we saw a lot of female lawyers, we saw a lot of female doctors on TV, general hospital, um, but we haven't really seen her in the female programs. And so I think that it's, it's been really cool to be kind of part of this movement of um, putting girls like Andy and Sophie and Tampon Run like out there for other girls to see and say like, hey, you know what, like, I can do that too. So that's what we're working on at Girls Who Go. Is, is all of your stuff available online to like look at and all your programming classes and what's that? So we offer the two programming, uh, like we have two program offerings. One is the after school clubs model and then one is the summer program. Um, the after school clubs model, the curriculum is open source. And anyone here who has a classroom of 10 or 15 or 20 girls who are 12 to 18 who want to learn the program, they're homeschooling, you know, yeah. crew, definitely. Um, the application to start a Girls Who Code Club is live right now. Um, basically, all you need is a cohort of kids and a computer lab. Um, if you don't know how to program yourself, we'll try to match up a volunteer um, with your club to kind of teach the curriculum. We do, do training for the curriculum um, as well as classroom management. And uh, if you do know how to program, then we'll teach you. You should volunteer. We have a few clubs in Detroit right now that need an instructor, so definitely something to consider. Cool. Question? Is that just around the Michigan area or is it the state? Yeah. Uh, so it's national, actually. So we're based in New York. Um, we have summer programs in uh, Boston, New York, DC, Miami, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco, and LA. Uh, we did have a summer program here in Detroit in 2013, but we haven't been able to bring it back yet. Uh, so I am actively looking for sponsors for 2016. So any of the corporate uh, crew here, anyone who's working for you know Microsoft or uh, GM is interested in this kind of thing, definitely let me know. But um, yeah, we're all over the place. And the clubs are in, I think we have clubs now in 26 states across the country. I'm going to pass this on to my boss. I work in Cincinnati, oh, yeah. the department, mm -hmm. and they've actually sent grant money up, and right now they're uh, doing a coding project for a bunch of high school kids. Mm -hmm. I'm going to step in through that, but uh, I have a female boss, so this may be uh, yeah. uh, another idea of something, another area where she might want to put her efforts to, plus we get funding for it. Yeah, totally. And we do uh, the clubs as well as summer programs actually on site at corporate sponsors, so if that, you know, if maybe they'd be interested in trying a club before going, you know, full force and doing our program. There was a question up front. Yeah, I wanted to comment that um, you might know this, but women have been integral to the creation of computer science. Um, you have to show your girls, if you don't, the photo of the Emacs programmers. Mm -hmm. uh, is one of my favorite photos, like historic photos. It is really, and it's interesting too because, you know, I think that especially for for girls, and a lot of the kids that we serve are um, underprivileged, and, you know, it's very clear what the pathway is if you want to become a lawyer, if you want to become a doctor, like you do pre-med, you know, you, like there's, there's different steps along the way, right? And to become a programmer, or to you know who they see is Jack Dorsey. They you know they, they see the social network and they think, okay, in order to do this, I have to be a boy genius, skinny white boy with monster dropping out of college, and then now I'm an internet billionaire. Like that's the story that they know, you know. And I, <laughs> sign me up for that. Um, 
<laughs> but so I, you know, part of the program is really kind of showcasing women and men in the industry and just kind of showing them like, okay, this is the path. Like it's not necessarily a ladder, it's kind of more of a jungle gym. And like you can get different places, different ways. Um, but there's, it's not just like this weird black boxy thing that happens that you just drop out of college and now you're a billionaire. <laughs> so, yeah. I guess what I have is more of a comment. Um, and I will try to make this short so you guys don't want to steal any of the show. But I didn't become a developer until I was 20. Yeah. I have a degree, in, I have a bachelor's degree in English, and I worked in various administrative jobs that I needed. Mm -hmm. and decided it was time to make a change. We got involved in the hackerspace movement, and I was like, oh, it's coding stuff, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So I actually went back to school, and it was okay for it. The internship was what was the best thing. Mm -hmm. Also, the online resources. Also, there is a community of women, and it's a national organization, so there's a Detroit and Ann Arbor chapter of Girls Belt that they do classes, and they have meetups, <coughs> and it's fantastic. Yep. And like the meetups are great because I love going, Like I, I'll take my laptop and maybe open it, but I love going just to talk to people and encourage them. And you know, you have women my age and older, I'm 30, yeah. and you have women my age and older who are like, I want to do this, but I don't know what to do. Yeah. And so I can, I like being able to talk to them and help. And so there is that community as well. It is really important, and I think that we have seen, you know, not only are girls not opting into STEM fields going into college, but the ones who do often drop out their first, you know, year or so, and especially that's the case in computer science. And CS 101 is often not really CS 101. The professors really assume that you know quite a bit, and the jargon and everything, you know, it's all very intimidating. And so the girls, girls often drop that first CS class. And, and you know, I, I completely understand that's what the, the one semester that I went back to school, which made me eligible for summer of code, gosh, two or three years ago, um, I was majoring in Spanish translation at the time that I, I did for one semester. But I, I went up and talked to the computer science professors and, and told them who I was and that I was going to try and apply for summer of code. And I was laughed at by them. And I, I will never forget being told, I don't know why they would accept you. Of course, then I went back after I was accepted and noticed that the only one from Kent State who was accepted that year was me. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I tried to think of a, a good excuse to go up and say hi and mention that to them, but I never could figure out a good excuse for, to go up and say hi and be like, oh, and by the way, I was accepted. I noticed that none of your other students were. Yeah. You just have to hack in and leave that message. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I will never forget. I, I don't think I ever went back to talk to them then. I wanted to talk to them honestly and ask, do I have to use Windows yeah. <laughs> if I take your classes? Because I'm using Linux and I, I've attempted to take computer science classes before and been told that I had to use Windows and been like, why? Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's a normal requirement. Right, right. But I, 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 I've looked at other classes and, and been told that. At, oh, at yeah, and at Michigan State, they just because the the free pro like the the compiler, right? They only got it free for Windows, right? That was exactly. the reason that you use Windows, so, right. or you could just have the same box, so. right? <laughs> There's a huge opportunity now to engage in, in guerrilla philanthropy as opposed to like guerrilla warfare. Uh, you don't have to you don't have to become um, you don't have to become personally wealthy before you can start contributing to projects, and it, particularly because there's these spaces emerging like like what we have who we have on this yeah. panel here. We have people from all these different backgrounds, different educational tracks, you know, more more traditional educational tracks, not traditional. We have traditional and not traditional educators on this panel. Um, you, you know, Aaron's a not traditional.